and I told him. Did, I did forget to mention that, in case you're wondering, Chris tore his Achilles. I'll let him tell the story. But in, in case you uh, were interested as why he's limping around, that's, that's why. First presentation with a scooter that I've ever done. <laughs> okay, so I nearly fell. No, um, in this hand, I hold a letter, and it's from your rock star. Your A player, your right person, right seat. Can you envision them? Got them? What's in it? Please accept this as my resignation. Damn. How did this happen? Are you freaking kidding me? What if I were to tell you it's all your fault. Your inability to let go. <laughs> Clicker. Your inability to let go and delegate effectively is the reason they resign. Clearly, I'm here to cause you a little pain today and maybe have a laugh or two. It's gonna get uncomfortable. So, escape hatch there and there, if you're gonna go, go now. <laughs> but I also wanna paint a path to growth and freedom for you. So that's what we're here today to work on. Imagine this. We come up with an idea as an entrepreneur. We're like, I'm gonna solve a problem. We're going to fix something in the world, create some value. I think we're I'm going to do this. So we start a business, and we get after it, and it starts working. And it starts working so well that we get busy enough that we need to hire somebody. It's a good thing. And so we heard that our mothers, brothers, sister-in-laws, friends, uncles, dogs, friend, um, was looking for work. And so we hire them. And we don't really interview them much and we, we don't really train them a ton. And we're like, hey, go off and do this thing because I'm, like, I'm busy over here. And so we hire them up. And lo and behold, the first uh, problem shows up. And like a hero, we jump on our white steed and ride to their rescue and proceed to solve the problem for them. Tell them exactly what to do. And company grows, customers happy, we're, ha we're happy, all's good. Second problem shows up. And they try and solve it this time. They think they got an idea what's going on. We happen to see it. Oh, that's not exactly how I would have done it. So I pr we proceed to educate them on exactly what done right looks like. And so when the next problem shows up, they come back to us, like, why wouldn't they? And this happens again and again and again. And we start to wonder, like, well, why did we hire them in the first place? This doesn't make sense. They're not really saving me that much time. And so all of a sudden we realize, oh, no, we've become the dreaded micromanager. Uh-oh. Now, two things tend to happen when we arrive here. Our A players are like, dude, I'm out of here. I can go work somewhere else. Peace, them out of here. And they give us that resignation letter. Bs and Cs tend to stay. They're like, hey, you know, this is all right. I got a job. I'm happy to get paid. You know, and both are bad for entrepreneurial companies. Right? And so the internal dialogue as this all happens looks something like this. I'm like, what the f Like... <laughs> How did we get here? I thought we had something good. So I need to rethink the whole thing. And you know what? I saw this meme from Steve Jobs the other day. That guy was so smart. And he allegedly said, why hire smart people and tell them what to do? We're going to hire smart people and get them to tell us what to do. Yes, this is it. This is totally it. 
Okay, so we're gonna hire somebody really smart, really talented, really expensive, but they're gonna be worth it, right? This is, totally makes sense. Okay, so we try this and we hire them. And then why would we train them? I mean, the whole purpose of this, you're supposed to tell me what to do, so why would I train you a ton? So we send them off into the wild. And I call this hippie leadership. Oh, it's good, man. And it's like throwing a delegation grenade, except we're throwing flowers and, you know, because we're hippies. And so, and we throw the, hippie, the grenade over the fence and we're like, one, huh, I wonder what's happening out there. Two, I haven't heard from them in a while. I wonder what's going on. And three, boom, right? Everything blows up. And even worse than it did before because there was zero direction and guidance from us. And we weren't watching at all. And so this is tough. Our brain in this place is still giving, like, what the series is going on here? And so we feel really conflicted at this time. So we revert back to death group management because they hurt my baby. Meanwhile, companies hurtling forward at the speed of sound, continuing to grow and evolve, and we're just stuck in this really odd space of knowing we need to let go, but scared to do so. And it's just, it's like this valley of despair that we reached, knowing we're in a tough spot, knowing we need to let go, not wanting to do it, the delegation dilemma. Some of our A players are leaving us. We don't want to lose any more. Our Bs and Cs are becoming like submissive drone robots. And, you know, we know they're not proceeding the way they would. we know they're capable of. We know we're failing them as a leader because we know it's on us why they're not getting there. So we feel guilty. That's a tough spot to be. We get these blips of growth and then we just drop right back down again. And all of a sudden we realize the business owns us. We've built our own shackles. We've become the bottleneck to growth and freedom. If you've ever heard the saying, the bottleneck's always at the top of the bottle, yeah, we're living it, right? And so what do we do here? So two questions I just wanna ask the room. First off, Give me a hands up, visionaries in the room. Thank you. Integrators? Sales, marketing, combined leaders? Awesome. Finance leaders? Ops leaders? I didn't see one difference in percentage in the room. Come back to that in a minute. Can I ask you to be a little bit open, honest, and vulnerable in the spirit of EOS today? Don't put your, I want you to put your hands up if you don't struggle with delegation and letting go. Like you're like, I got this nail. Sweet. <laughs> you don't struggle. I'm like, awesome, we have one person has it figured out and he made a mistake. You know? <laughs> so the good news is you're in the right room. Um, Right, you're not, but the point I want, to know, want you to understand is you're not alone. If we look at the research, I know visionary that did research, it is possible, but I did some. And, <laughs> and so I looked into delegating effectively and there's this John Hunt guy, very often quoted stat around delegation. And it's about effectively doing it. And they polled a bunch of managers and from the manager's perspective, how many do you think are good at it? Only uh, 30% said they were good at it, right? So white's good, red's bad. So only 30% they were good at it, thought they were good. From the employee's perspective, only 33% of the employees thought their manager was effective at delegating. So said another way, we think we suck at it and our employees think we suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> so I see this and I'm like, holy, this is a big problem. It's a big problem. And as the hands just showed, this is not just an entrepreneur's problem. This is not just a founder's problem or an integrator's problem. 
There was balance in the room and the hundreds of leaders that I've worked with over the last while have shown the same thing. Every position struggles with this. And so if we don't do good at this, get good at this, people, good people leave. Worse, the bad people stay. Right? And so there's a big cost to this. And if we think about cost, the cost of turnover is big too. More research, I know it's really shocking, more than once. But there was numerous studies show the cost of turnover. That's hilarious. Uh, slide import to a new computer, that's funny. Um, that's like my body right now. It's like sort of funny. <laughs> so anyways, um, the, the cost of turnover, somewhere between 30% of a year's salary for frontline repetitive work and up to 400% for leadership team high level leaders is the true cost of a yearly salary. So if we put that into a number, you're looking somewhere at a $60,000 average salary just for sake of math, somewhere between 18 and $240,000 cost of turnover per employee, per employee. And if I'm looking at these studies and I'm going, not one of them filtered for A players. So, I don't know about you, but I got A, you know, I hope you all have A players from frontline all the way through the leadership team. And if you look at average cost of turnover compared to that, it, it's just gonna be higher. Is it two times or 10 times higher? Right, so putting the math to it, it's a big problem. Which as an entrepreneur, I'm going smoking. This is an opportunity. We think we suck. Our employees think we suck. It's costing us tons of money. Nobody's good at it. Wow, sweet. Let's dive into this. Why is no one talking about this? Why is no one talking about it? And so A players are choosing where they go now, right? More than ever before. They're going to companies that are great companies. They have an awesome culture. They're going to give you autonomy, they're gonna, good working conditions. They got their poop in a group, right? Like they've got options and they're exercising them. And so how do we figure out the key to growth and freedom on this? How do we let go and delegate better and still be able to rest well at night? So I see this opportunity to stand out. And if we can figure this out, I think it gives us an unfair advantage over the market. Would you like to have that in your business? Right? Because I think if we could figure this out, the best employees are going to stay and we're going to attract even more of those people. You know, versus the point of departure, come, you don't figure this out and they're going to be running away from us. I want version A. I don't know about you, right? That's what excites me about this topic. And so what I've done for you and what brought me to the front of the room today is just let me explain a little bit about my story. So there were signs I was an entrepreneur from a young age. I left home for the first time before I was two. <laughs> I didn't like what was happening in my house and out the door I went. <laughs> you know, so my parents, loving, caring parents that I have took a photo of me. Uh, that's actually me leaving my house. Um, they really were the most amazing parents. Uh, they also knew they had to let me explore. Some lessons I had to learn on my own. This was one of them. Now, I didn't get very far because I forgot to pack a lunch. Um, but hey, not all my endeavors have been successful. And so I went on to take entrepreneurship in university, started my first business in, in university. I invented a football glove for receivers, high-grip material. That endeavor went much better than the endeavor at two. Um, had lots of fun there. And then I used EOS to grow my company and had you know, all sorts of fun stuff there. But that delegation story was my early story. I for sure was the death grip manager. Did not know what I was doing. I lost good people because of it. And I'm embarrassed to say I did the hippie leadership team thing too. <laughs> Complete disaster, right? So I've done this, so I'm, I'm there with you on this, if you're struggling with this. Um, it all changed for me in one moment. One of my rock stars, 
called me out and he said, why'd you hire me if you're just gonna do my job for me? I was like, oh, like, ow. And I knew he was right, 100% right. I'm like, dang, this guy's a stud. And I'm like doing everything, like what is going on here? I'm like, I gotta change. I gotta change fast. And so I got better at it. I made a really intentional decision that moment. I gotta fix this. I got better at it so much, EOS helped me a ton in figuring out how. So I found that a little bit after that point. Like, it really helped. I got so good and liked delegating so much. I delegated everything in my company until I was three hours a month with no role in the day-to-day. -day. Just a guide, advisor, to leadership team. That was really fun. Did that for three years as a guide and in 2018 sold the company with no role in the transition. They were running it, handed over the keys, signed over the shares, off we go. So I've walked this walk. So I'm here today to give you hope and help. Right, hope that if you're struggling with it, it's okay. I've been there, lots of people have, lots of people have, and so it's okay. And help. I created some of my own material uh, based on my book. Um, I've got a four hour workshop on this. In bringing it to the conference, I had to EOS it up a bit and really dial it in and tie stuff to tools for you. And I pulled out the three big steps that I need you to know from today. But you know, no, I really had to get ruthless in cutting stuff to get down to a 50 minute time limit. So here we go. All right, so where do we start? We're gonna start rooting this in the tool of LMA. And the, the leadership practices, the third tool, right? I'm sure not shocked, I am letting go of the vine. Now, this talk is for one and a half years and up with EOS. Can, can you be honest with me here? Are you less than one and a half years on your journey with EOS? How many do I got? Okay, anybody like brand new to EOS? Okay, so I'm not gonna have a ton of detail here for you, so I apologize in advance, but most of the people in the room understand LMA, lead, manage, accountability. And the third thing is am I letting go of the vine? And so the two things under letting go of the vine that most of you should know and love by this stage of the journey is the delegate and elevate, right? So we're gonna delegate and elevate. We're gonna create an opening for our teammate to step up into. And the second piece is the disclaimer that if they don't GWC their seed, get it, want it, the capacity, for those that are new, don't let go of the vine, right? Because something's gonna blow up. Okay, so I wanna play all a little game with you today. Can you please participate? So I'm gonna ask you a question and I'm gonna go like this and you're all in unison and you're gonna go, no, okay, all right, so please. All right, so give, give, hold on to that thought, not quite yet. All right, so can you believe that leaders that choose to delegate and elevate something to one of their teammates and their teammate GWCs the seat don't actually let go? No. Yes, they do. I know it's hard to believe, but they do it. That was pretty good, good job. Okay, so like, so we teach this tool as implementers and they're still not letting go. And I'm like, what's this? Uh, what's up with this? And it's happening over and over and over again. I'm like, what's going on here? So what do we do? Well, there's an invisible barrier in the way. And what's stopping us from doing this thing that we know we need to do? So let me explain this a little bit. Um, this workshop, for, or there's three, it, three things I'm gonna cover in the breakout. Let me just tell you what they are to set the context for where we're headed. First one is elephant first, not gonna mean anything yet. Right? The second one is the elevated hero is a coach. And the third one is get real. Okay, so those are the three steps I'm gonna take you through today. And to help you get there is the understanding, right? Stephen Covey, amazing, saw him speak. One of his habits, seek first to understand. And so that's where we're gonna start. And so in understanding this issue, again, I, I did more research, I had help. Um, and so it, the review of this HB article was a pretty typical article in this space. 
And let me share with you what the main over the findings were. Right, the first thing, choose great people. Let's choose smart people, they're gonna be talented at what they do, they got some experience, etc. cetera. Like, makes 100% sense. Secondly, we're gonna make a plan, a cheat sheet, keep it top of mind, visible, and again, really smart, we're gonna work that plan. And third thing is, we're gonna make it okay to, for them to call us out and be accountable for the journey. Hey, am I not doing a good job at this? You have permission to hold me accountable. All great stuff. And so I looked into more research, similar common threads and all this stuff. Really intelligent. I like this stuff, it's all amazing. But what I've experienced and witnessed and observed in leadership teams, these articles are missing the main point. The major obstacle that they're struggling with, the barriers, they're lightly touching on it or completely missing it. And let me explain that concept to you, that barrier to you with an analogy an analogy, Jonathan Haidt's book in The Happiness Hypothesis. He talks about how our brain functions like a rider in an elephant. And the rider is the conscious, rational, logical self. Right? We know the, the left brain side, if you will. Versus the other side, the elephant is everything else, the emotional, unconscious, occasionally even irrational side of us. And so to help you understand this analogy, like we spend a lot of time negotiating with the rider. Well, logically, we should do this next. But we ignore the elephant at our peril. The elephant is a lot larger. And if, you know, for example, if we're deciding what to do and we want to go to Fiji and the elephant wants to go to the Arctic, well, I hope you like the frozen tundra. Right? It, like, if we don't have the elephant under control, we are not going where we logically want to go. And so we got to deal with the elephant. The HBR article, if we look at that, is that rider or elephant? Rider. Yeah, it's all rider. Very logical, totally makes sense. Minimizes or completely misses the emotional element in all of this. Irrational, unconscious. And so, to be successful, we gotta deal with this. All right, so story time. I'm in an annual with a client. Uh, two day annual, first day we do the one thing exercise, right? Listening to uh, Kim Scott there, radical candor. The opportunity to give real meaningful feedback is such a gift in the one thing exercise, and we get that. So I got a visionary owner, gives the finance leader feedback, I need you to speak up more and make more decisions. Finance leader's like, sounds like a good idea, listen, so the feedback makes a commitment, I'm going to speak up and make more decisions. We're like, everybody's happy. So day two rolls around, we're IDSing, an issue comes up, it's related to the finance component, and there's this debate going on, and it's contentious, and the finance leader starts to like fidget, and they start, they're like puffing, and they lean forward and they puff their chest and they're like, all right, this is what I think and I'm just gonna make the call, this is what we're gonna do. Visionary looks at them, that's a terrible fucking idea, that's never gonna work. <laughs> and I look at the emotions of the finance leader go from shock to confusion, to disgust, to disconnect, to screw this, I'm done. Full on checkout. Now the rider from the visionary was the logical, was speak up, make more decisions. You're on the finance team, like you're in this room, please speak up. But during ADS, it got emotional, the elephant took control, and he lost it. Now it might have been a terrible idea. <laughs> like, but that doesn't matter. Right? Because if you're trying to get someone and nurture them to speak up and make more decisions, they're going to screw up. The elephant took control. And so we got to start talking to our elephant. It's not that simple. Let me ask you a question here. Why do we typically need to delegate? We need more time. We need more time, right? Any others? 
All right, exactly. Right? We need more time. Right? We need more time. The number one reason why leaders don't delegate. <laughs> you see, the, you think this is as funny as I do. Like, is this logical, rational? No. This is a freaking elephant. Right? It doesn't make sense. And so to complicate all of this, we live in an age of speed. Everything's fast. Instant messaging, same day delivery, everything in a click of a button. Speed often is our competitive advantage as an entrepreneurial company. The problem is we're doing fast with how we're handling our people, and that shit doesn't work. Right? I've learned, I never used to be this woo woo guy until I started diving into this stuff. It really does make a difference. Like, and so we got to, I learned that, like, we got to understand our emotions. And so to do that, oh, first off, right? Speed, speed, right? The, the speed, speed's the addiction that's slowing us down in this scenario, right? Speed's the addiction that's slowing us down. And so we, how is speed killing us? Well, last time I checked, elephants can't sprint. Right? So we got to take that time to slow down and think. And I don't know about you. Slow down, anyone? That's just like recoil. It's slowing down. You can tell I really like going slow. Like slow is hard for us to think that way. And so I'm going to take you through an exercise here today to help you understand your emotions, to help you slow down a minute, help you let go of that vine. Okay, so elephant first, right? That's the first point. Let's think of elephant first. So understand our emotions. So there's some basic emotions. Paul Ekman's an acclaimed psychologist. He did a bunch of research, um, went across the world and found there were 10 basic emotions common across all cultures in the world. And so uh, I got to read. Happy, sad, disgust, fear, surprise, anger. And then second study was pride, shame, excitement, and embarrassment. So these 10 emotions are common across all cultures. Now there's a whole bunch of other emotions and feelings too. If you Google the emotions or feelings wheel, it's outstanding. Um, you know, despite what I tried to tell my wife, uh, there's more than two emotions and she informed me of that. And so that was good to know. Like it's, there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? And so I want you to pull out the worksheet here and spend a minute and can you circle the emotion that shows up for you when it comes to letting go? If it's not on there, please add it. This is just a starting point, these 10. What's the top emotion? And if you can, try to answer the why it's showing up for you to the right of that. Is anybody willing to share? Be vulnerable, give a gift to the room, thank you. Pride, thank you. Why? You don't have to, that's okay. Um, I feel like I do the best work out of a lot of people. I've, so that's I've, the main reason. I appreciate your honesty, <laughs> right? Yes? Disgust. Disgust, yeah. Right, right. Thank you for the honesty. I've got one in the back. I think for me, it's being an entrepreneur and I felt fear of putting my baby over to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate the shares. One more. 
Yeah, also fear um, that somebody else isn't going to be able to do it as well as I will. Of course. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for the honesty. The, 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 the delegate, the let go majors, as I call them, are fear. All right, you're going to hurt my baby. You're going to mess it up. And it's evil twin pride, right? Am I going to be important still to the company? Am I going to be relevant? What if they do it better than me? And sometimes these are unconscious, sometimes irrational, etc. cetera. Um, you ever heard the statement, or has it, has it ever crossed your mind? Let me rephrase this question. Can you believe that leaders think, if I just do it myself, it'll get done faster? Can you believe the leaders say that? No. no. Yes! It's plus, it happens all the time. In fact, my wife shared that with me when I shared this presentation, right? Does, do we know that that actually makes sense or makes no sense? Of course, we know it makes no sense at all because it's a short-term solve at best and yet it happens. So here's an example for you, real life story for me. So I'm transitioning out of my sporting goods company. We create a plan, 12 month transition I'm going to fire myself from each seat on the leadership team until they're 12 months later, they're going to be running completely without me. So we make the plan. We start working the plan. Six months in, we're at a quarterly meeting. My integrator, Frankie, calls me out and says, so Chris, um, 12 months, hey? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. We got the plan. We're working the plan. I'm teaching everything I know. And in 12 months, we're going to be done. We can do it. We can do it. And Frankie looks at me, and he's like, we don't need 12 months. In fact, what you don't understand is we have an excited, engaged team about where we're going for the future. And it's like you're dangling the keys in front of us. We're ready to drive, man. Give us the keys. And he says, and by the way, um, I hope you don't have plans for your office, because we have plans for that, too. <laughs> And I'm like, ugh, don't you want me? Don't you need me? And I'm like, wait a second. I wanted freedom, so I go to start another business, and here he is handing it to me on a silver platter. So I took a deep breath. I recognized that ego was showing up for me. I tied it to the why. Right? Why am I doing this? And I trusted Frankie. I'm like, you know what? Let's, let's, Say you're right. Let's speed up my transition. Instead of three to four days a week that I'm going to be working here, let's go immediately to one to two starting tomorrow. And let's see if we can get out faster. I got out nine months instead of 12. He was right. Please don't tell him. Um, and, and I let go. And as I dug and reflected deeper on that experience, as I dug deeper, there was fear. Not that he wasn't going to do it right in my case. I was lucky. I had an absolute right person, right, star, right seat rock star. Because I was scared of the next business. It wasn't super successful me one to two days a week. It wasn't generating a ton of cash flow for me. And my sporting goods company was my safe place. Guaranteed salary. Knew what I was doing. It was sucking the life out of me. But it was time to go. And I'm, so the fear was there too for me. So I got focused on that end goal, tied to the Y, got my elephant on side. All right, now on to the second step. Remember the rescue part of the story? That has an evil side to it. And it often shows up like I was just trying to help. But by doing so, there's a dark side to that. That death grip piece steals opportunities for growth for our teammates. It creates reliance. It's a short-term solve at best, right? Helping too much will hurt. So that hero piece, give you a 
quick example. I was a volunteer in an accelerator program, EO accelerator program, as I was cutting my teeth as a coach. I, quite frankly, I was masquerading as a coach. I was a volunteer, so you know, I was getting, getting what I paid for. Um, in this accountability group meetings, we'd have a group of entrepreneurs, and I'm coaching them, challenging them, mentoring them, etc. And each meeting, they had to check out, each monthly meeting, you had to check out with the one thing you're going to do before the next meeting. And so this one guy checks out, and he throws this softball at me, and I look at that, and I'm like, dude, let's call him Joe. Joe, you've been complaining about the same thing for the last four months, and yet your accountability checkout isn't tied to that. And he says, I'm like, I think you need to deal with that before you come to the next monthly meeting. He's like, yeah, I should probably do that. Okay, I'll take that. So a month goes by, we show up at the next meeting, accountability check-in. He's like, Joe's like, I did it. And it wasn't really as bad as I thought it was going to be. Life's amazing. We actually grew. Holy crap, that was so good. So we continued. The, and as a coach, I'm like, yeah, sweet, right? Go the rest of the meeting, the end of the meeting. Okay, Joe, it's your time to check out. What's your accountability for the next month's meeting? He says, oh, I don't have one. Uh, you did such a good job, Chris, last time. I'm just going to get you to give me mine again. And I was like, Ugh! like I physically recoiled. I'm like, oh, no, I've screwed something up. I was a rookie, and I still knew something went horribly wrong there. He'd stop thinking for himself. He'd started, he was reliant on me, and I'm like, whoa, 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 like this is not how this works here. And so I, helping too much will hurt. So we got to learn that balance. So how do we get away from hero? The elevated hero is a coach. Is step number two, right? The elevated hero is a coach. If we are getting have the tendency to get stuck in hero mode, Start thinking about how do I be a coach here. Uh, give credit to Cartman, Carbon's Drama Triangle for this concept, right? But how do we transition in that moment? And so watch out, it's a trap, right? Two pitfalls I want to make you aware of here is that our employees will try and trap us here. Some want us to play the hero. It makes them feel safe. They also have no accountability in that situation. Right. It, the, the second side is that we can go too far if we're not being the hero and give them no guidance and direction, and then we're throwing delegation and grenades. Right? That's hippie leadership. And so we got to find the right balance. So how do we become a great coach? You're all running on EOS, or about to run on EOS, and the LMA tools is where you're going to dig in here. And so we're just talking about the one, I'm letting go of the vine, but you think about the other five points there, and tell me which one of these points doesn't relate to great coaches. I'm giving clear direction. I'm providing the necessary tools, resources, training, people, your time. I am acting in the greater good. I am taking clarity breaks, thinking about the challenges that we're facing. On the management side, I'm setting clear expectations, communication, the right meeting pulse, having quarterly conversations, and recognizing and rewarding our teammates. Like all those, Ed, can anybody tell me any of those that great coaches don't have a masterful relationship with? And so I challenge you when you go back from today, double down on your LMA skills. Don't just tick the box so that your implementer says, okay, you're done. Really check it. And understand, like I could talk for probably two days on coaching techniques that I've learned. And that's limited. Right? It's an endless journey. It's why I'm so excited doing what I do. I will never master what I do as a coach. So much fun. So how do you find the right balance? Invest in your own coach. I learn a lot from mine. I have multiple coaches and mentors <laughs> on the go at any given time with different areas of my life. Uh, read great books. Humble Inquiry is a fantastic one. Uh, Kim Scott's stuff, Radical Candor is an outstanding read. Get your, own, get your own coaches. That point's been made. Okay, so it didn't happen by accident for me that my coaching skills grew. 
I thought I got pretty intentional with it. Related to coaching, I'm going to talk about everybody's least favorite thing. Uh, practice. Right. And so, yes, I'm talking about practice. Now, slight tangent. I'm a visionary. I'm allowed to do that. So, anyways, Alan Iverson, who's pictured here, if you don't know the real story behind this, his best friend had just, he'd just been notified his best friend died. He was drinking in behind the scenes, and someone pushed him to take the mic, and he said no, and they, they kind of pushed him into doing it. And he got on the mic and went off about, seriously, we're talking about practice? Like, life was going on for him. So, tangent. Yeah, so, the people don't love practice. They want the real games. Not just Alan Iverson sharing his true feelings of, like, something so trivial. But what I want to do is reframe for you delegation. It is not a late switch that we tick the box in LMA with the OS and we're done. It is a delegation practice. It's a journey. And just like parenting, delegation is not efficient. At the beginning, it takes time to get good at this. And so I could go deeper on coaching. We're going to stop there based on time, but this is what I got for you. The third step that I've got for you, you know, bottom line is, sorry, let me tie that point down. If we get better at coaching, it's going to bring us closer to letting go and being able to sleep at night, delegating better, better coaches, moving us closer to that goal. Acting like hero will move us in the opposite direction. That's the main point I want you to understand from this. Elevated hero is a coach. Okay, third step. How do we get real? How do we get real? With our time, our energy, and our priorities. Time, energy, priorities. I can tell your real priorities by looking at your calendar, by looking at the issues you're solving with your team, by looking at where you place the meetings where you have the most energy, by looking at your rocks, and your goals. So Dan Sullivan says all progress starts with the truth. So the reason this is such a critical step in letting go is we got to get real with ourselves. And we think we're going to delegate effectively and let go and it's not going to bother us and we're just like, hey, we're done. It doesn't work that way. So best practice is like, I bring someone new onto my team that's a direct report for me I start blocking stuff in meetings in my calendar with them. And I'm not a great manager, let's get clear, as a natural visionary. But I've recognized i got to prioritize them in my calendar to make this happen. Um, what are your clarity break topics if you're struggling with this? Mark it down on that little thing on the worksheet of things I might be able to do about this. Explore this further. So, um, pitfall. Pitfall common. Pitfall here is you must know your employee. Just like Kim Scott said, you are going to have people that are rock stars. They're really good. Well, the, uh, that was my words, not hers. Her definition's a little different. You're going to have awesome people. They're incredibly talented people. They need more guidance from you, collaboration. And then you're going to have other people that are greener and newer at this. They're going to need more hands-on work as they figure things out. It's your job to know the difference. Rock stars and superstars? Or, yeah, same idea. Know your people if we're going to get real and how we prioritize effectively so our priorities are serving our people better. So... The next thing we need to do, um, we are in San Diego, uh, I couldn't resist, is that if we prioritize well, occasionally we're going to end up in points where we screw things up. And we're going to need to apologize. You know, now Ted Lasso was brilliant at this. I get it, it's just a show. But the behaviors that he modeled in that show were phenomenal from a leadership standpoint. He would say something and it wouldn't land. 
And he'd right away go, oh, dude, I'm so sorry. That was not what I intended by that. That clearly didn't land. I'm sorry, let's try again. Brilliant stuff versus, now the thing that I know, you'd notice about Ted Lasso, if you watch the show, his humility. He never had to be right. Ron Burgundy from Anchorman, ego was enormous. He could barely fit his head through the door. And so his, his apologies were half-assed because he actually didn't think he did anything wrong. And so if you're prioritizing your relationship with letting go, with delegating over top of your ego, show that humility to serve your teammates, you're going to be better at this. Okay. I got to move to summarize to make sure we're finished on time here. These three steps for you, right? Elephant first. If we don't take care of our emotions, the elephant's going somewhere, and despite what we tell the rider, we got to spend more time negotiating with the elephant. Learn about that, slow down, understand our emotions at play. Secondly, the elevated hero is a coach. Recognize that it's a journey to figure this out, to be a hero, or to, to be a coach over a hero. The coach is going to move us closer to the goal we want of letting go. The hero is going to move us further away. And finally, let's get real with our time, our energy, and our priorities. Now, what do we do coming out of today? Most people, the average person is going to come into one of these seminars, get the little dopamine hint, I learned something, I feel better about myself, and they're not going to do anything. I didn't hear, come here to help you be average. I came here to help you be exceptional. The exceptional people take action with the stuff in which they're challenged on. Not one person put up their hand and said they're awesome at this. So what can you do, the one step to take action towards it? Can you write something in the bottom side of that worksheet? Can you go and hire that coach that you've been thinking about hiring? Can you journal about what's going on for emotions and the challenges you're faced with in this? Can you spend time in your clarity break on this? Whatever it is, please do it. Another one of the options is you could buy my book. And so I make 70 cents a book here, folks. So I'm planning to retire on the revenues debt generated from these. No, no seriously, I'm kidding. Uh, I wrote this book for you. I was called to write this book. I had to share my story. The way I can, vul I can vulnerably share a story that people connect, can connect to and the lessons I've learned, I had to get it out there. It walks through my journey of letting go of my team till I let everything go. And it also journals my implementation of EOS and a bunch of stuff that I learned there, so it might help you on that journey too. But I wrote this for you, so please take advantage of that work that I did. Uh, I'd love it if you could. All right. Okay, so last thing. You got a letter from another A player. Oh no, what's in this one? And this time, open it up and it says, hey, I just wanted to thank you for being such a great mentor, coach, and friend. I've never had so much work, fun working at a company and doing such amazing things. I love where we're headed. Please take this gift certificate to take your wife out for dinner. See you Monday. I'm here, I got that letter. I'm here so that you can get it too. Thank you, I'm Chris Jones. <laughs>